What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Habituation Room podcast live stream on a Tuesday as usual. I'm your host, Francesca Fiorentini. We have a jam-packed show, and I have to be brief about everything. Um, we are going to be joined in a little bit uh, by comedian Sammy Obeyed. You've probably seen him on this show, or you've seen him live. The guy performs um, an I don't even know. I was going to say an enviable amount, but my God, he's a hustler, baby. Um, and I'm so excited to have him here. He is Palestinian as well. Um, and he's been on the road during this entire thing. And I'm very, very excited and curious to hear from him as we talk uh, about what's going on in the latest in Gaza. Um, obviously, there's this floating of a four day ceasefire, maybe three, maybe five. Who knows? Oh my God, let the killing commence once it's over. Um, we're going to also be joined by a um, long time uh, clamored for journalist who works with AJ, my former colleague, the wonderful Dina Takuri, is going to be here. She's going to talk about. What is going on in the West Bank right now? Um, given that she's done a lot of reporting from the West Bank, specifically from the hometown of her parents uh, in Hebron, um, which she won a Peabody Award for that coverage. Um, she also wrote a book with Ahed Tamimi, who, if you all remember, um, slapped an Israeli soldier in 2020. What, what year was it? Dina will tell us. Um, and became an international icon, the Greta Thunberg of the West Bank. Um, Ahed has since been detained multiple times and more recently under this war has been detained. So we'll get the latest um, from her about what's going on and also just how things are looking in the West Bank um, uh, and even since her reporting. So anyway, if you are here, you know what to do buttons buttons clicks button shares all right you're liking the stream you're sharing the stream if you're listening in as, as a podcast do we make it number one and number two can you give this podcast five stars as sort of like a parting gift to the world like hey things are bad i'm underwater but like five stars because this was tight anyway so thank you for doing that um and also given that this show is show 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 short every um thursday tuesday that's what it is there's more show it's a Friday bonus bish. And no, I will not be doing one this Friday. Uh, I'll be away for the holidays um, or the holiday. But last week was kind of great. Like it was a really good show. A couple of good things happened. One, I had a fresh haircut, so it looked pretty good. Number two, I talked about Osama bin Laden. So honestly, when those two things collide in your life, like bin Laden plus nice hairdo, like you just kind of have to mm, give it up to God. And uh, that's what happened on Friday. So we talked about that. We also looked at real anti-Semitism, uh, specifically coming from the right, Candace Owens, um, who I'm still not convinced is smart enough to know that she's doing anti-Semitism, but it doesn't matter. She's got a massive platform and we all know who she's talking to. Uh, she was talking to Tucker Carlson. So that was, we looked at that, patreon.com slash situation room. You can get all of that bonus content, including last week's episode, in your ear holes, in your eye holes, uh, patreon.com slash situation room three dollars five dollars ten dollars a month gets you a shout out guys it is literally only you who support this show the show is ad free all right nobody wants to run ads on this they're like what are you i don't get it are you good enough for my like weird bra company no i mean yes i'm better anyway the point is you guys. So thank you so much in advance for everybody who has become part of the Frantifa officially. Um, but with that said, guys, there is so much to get into. Let's jump in 
Um, also, there's all, but, well, okay, I'm, I'll tell you about it later. Let's get started. <sighs> What are you bitching about today, people? What's crawled up your little anus and died? Um, for me, obviously, um, the IDF. But like beyond that, um, let's talk about what's happening in Argentina very briefly. Um, we will have on uh, later in the month, uh, Nico Guzman, who is a commentator on like Argentine politics. He's basically like a has a YouTube program where he talks about politics in Argentina. He's great. His English is like upsettingly perfect. He's going to come on in a couple weeks and ex explain what's going on. But basically a man named Javier Malay, a crazy, literally nicknamed a local um, presidential candidate won the presidency. He is a libertarian. He is a sort of neo-fascist anti-woke psycho. And I know it's weird to say anti-woke because it is, uh, Argentina and not the United States, but yes, uh, the anti-woke strug struggle is global. Anywhere where there are small dicked, um, megalomaniacal, uh, egomaniacs who have too much money and time on their hands, you're gonna have an anti-woke movement. Um, Millet, he won 56% of the votes compared to Massa. Now, Massa was part of the Union para la Patria, which was basically the center and center left even um, party. And he um, represented kind of a continuation of Peronism and what, what is currently um, with um, President Fernandez, who's currently in office now, um, the same old, same old. And when I say same old, same old, I truly mean kind of centrist, not really doing anything, uh, like no real big ideas, and yet claiming that they are the legacy of like Juan Juan Domingo Perón. What was his name? First middle name? I live there. I don't remember his middle name. Domingo. Um, that like they are of the people. Like they represent populism. And so, what I am bitching about is not only that Javier Malay is a nut job who's going to absolutely destroy whatever is left of Argentina's economy. But I am mad at the centrists and the center left for completely subsuming and taking all the air out of real social movements for change in, in Argentina. I lived there again for many years. And the idea that they again claim to be sort of they're the progressives. They're the liberals. They're the ones who care about civil rights. They're the ones who care about a national economy. They're the ones who care about, you know, national industry. They're the ones who are going to, you know, put money in your pocket. And they're the ones who care about, you know, expanding public services and expanding, you know, access to education and all this. And ostensibly that's true. But instead, what happened with the pink wave in Latin America is instead of actually building on the legacies of someone like Nestor Kirchner um, or building on the lessons learned from the neoliberal era in the early 2000s that tanked the effing economy, instead of building on the lessons of, yeah, I'm going to shout him out, my boy Hugo Chavez, you know, you guys know I'm a fan, um, Chavez and Morales, right, in Bolivia, Instead of building on some of these, the pink wave atrophied and allowed for the far right to come in. Now, most recently, the right in Argentina was Macri. And Macri was like, again, a John McCain, a like, you know, fiscal conservative, uh, like, you know, son of a real estate magnet, like just kind of like run George W. Bush, right? Javier Malay is a Trump. Javier Malay is a Bolsonaro. Javier Malay wants to obliterate all like uh ministries in government and here is a video showing him um sort of cartoonishly ripping down names of ministries as things he's going to obliterate when he gets to power tipo y deporte afuera ministerio de cultura afuera ministerio de ambiente y desarrollo sostenible afuera ministerio de las mujeres y género y diversidad afuera ministerio de obras públicas afuera aunque te resistas. Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología e Innovación. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Trabajo, Empleo y Seguridad Social. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Educación. Adoctrinamiento. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Transporte. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Salud. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Desarrollo Social. ¡Afuera! Se acabó el curro de la política. ¡Viva la libertad, carajo! 
Okay, so did I also mention he's an idiot? So he's basically saying like education ministry out, right? Um, ministry of social development out. Ministry of like health and gender out, right? All of these things. Now, he represents something really interesting, of course, which is, again, male chauvinism around the world. The idea, you know, Argentina was a site of a massive uprising of like feminist demanding abortion rights. Argentina did not have abortion rights prior to, I believe, 2019. So you're talking about like he is a backlash to that. He, yes, he's a little bit of a Bannonite. He's a little bit of the Trump, the Erdogan, the strongman BS or specifically what's annoying to me about this happening in a place like Argentina is number one, what he does to the economy, dollarizing it all that he, what he's going to wreak on that country, they will not be able to recover from in the way that four years of Trump, we were like, yeah, it sucked. It was bad. Children's were ch children's children were in cages, but like we didn't lose all of our life savings. Do you know what I mean? Like that's very different. When you fuck with an economy that's not at the top of the heap, you cannot recover from that for many, many decades. Now I understand that inflation in Argentina is in, it's 143%, guys. It's, it's fucking wild. But I guess what I'm really bitching about is the failure that his election exposes, which is again, the failure of a center of, a, of politics, of a political center, the failure of sort of the same old, same old from realizing they need to deliver a vision. They need to deliver results for people. They need actual forward thinking um, economic models that don't just rely on, in Argentina's case, exporting a bunch of soy, um, you know, you know, still money leaves that country in, in like flees that country basically um, as more and more of the rural like campo is consolidated uh, more and more people are displaced to cities like it Argentina uh, when, when I was living there it's very clear that they it lives in the future and the past uh, the Kishners was basically imagine if Obama actually was awesome right imagine if Obama was electoral Obama that's what the Kishners were but if you don't build on that vision if you don't like foster new leaders, if you don't actually push yourself to, again, yeah, there was some corruption. There was some, you know, uh, like uh, stealing off the top and whatnot. There was clientelism, effectively. I will give you a vote if you, I mean, I will give you food if you give me a vote, right? There was sort of a, like a an order of clientelism, even within the Kishner government. So that's a form of corruption. But real social movements in Argentina, no, they are not for neoliberal libertarian order like Millet represents and they are also not for that centrist do nothing oh we're the Peronists we're the, like we represent all populism we're incredible we're amazing what have you done you've literally done nothing so anyway all to say um we could talk a lot more about this on Friday curious about your thoughts your questions I know there's some Argentines watching and I'm also excited to bring on Nico in a couple weeks he will explain it uh but again I have a lot of faith that the people of Argentina if there's one thing they don't lack um, it is uh, uh, chutzpah and social movements, and they will have both of them very, very soon as this loco comes to power. With that, let me bring in my guest. Um, I believe, let's bring him into bitch, Lebanese, Palestinian, Syrian, Italian, American, comedian, born in Oakland, California. His work was described in the New York Times as an analytic style full of wordplay, clever misdirection, and ethnic humor. <laughs> That's what they say when they can't say you're funny. <laughs> no, but the New York Times always needs a reason that you're funny. Right. It's like it's like right. explaining a joke to somebody. Right. Like, <laughs> you can't do like, well, why are they funny? Um, but anyway, uh, Sammy, it's been a while and I'm so happy to have you here again. Like I said, I you've been out there touring, kind of like diving head into what's going on in Gaza. I mean, not yeah. Not like no, you're sitting down and having like open, you know, yeah. little meetings there, but you're actually right. talking about it on stage. Right, right. I have. And my my tour, uh, everything, co when everything happened, my tour in the South started. So, oh um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, people are always talking about like, oh, you're taking this side, or you're taking this side. It's like, trust me, in the South, they don't lack neither. All right. So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it was nice. You're like, it was, no, no, no. I'm like, I have a lot of Jewish friends. They're like, oh, yeah, I don't yeah, like exactly. that either. <laughs> I didn't have to add any disclaimers. It was clear. It was a, definitely a level playing field. Um, 
but uh but yeah um can what I, are you can bitching I, about please tell yeah, me what you're bitching about sammy so you know last six weeks you know worst worst ever just for anybody you know who knows people there or you're a palestinian origin just wor worst worst weeks ever and um, I have a hard time dealing with emotions, you know, but I've been crying. I've been, I've been dealing my best with it, but, uh, what's been the hardest part is the censorship that's going on. Yeah. Um, for me that I can't deal with emotionally just cause I, it gives me all this rage that Palestinian voices are silenced and we can't express ourselves. We can't say certain words and phrases on Twitter. And so all this anger builds up. And after about three weeks, I start to feel some pain in my stomach and, mm -hmm. I'm of the you know school of thought that like most illnesses we suffer have something to do with emotions on some level. So I'm um, right. like, I gave myself a self self inflicted wound, wound, whatever, and eventually it gets so bad I got to go to a doctor. Doctor finds out that the bacteria H. pylori has colonized in my gut. Oh my god! And I can't even talk about it on Twitter. What I'm going to do to that bacteria? That's the <laughs> level of censorship we're dealing with. And um, of course, when you get this, you, you're you're poised with the situation, you have to, you have to take antibiotics, or you're supposed to take antibiotics. Right. But if you have a low level of something, and it's not life threatening, obviously, if you have a life threatening bacteria, you should take antibiotics, right. But if it's like a low level, there's this kind of on the fence discussion of like, do I take the antibiotics? Because if you take the antibiotics, it kills the quote, unquote, bad bacteria, but right? What does it also take with it? right? Countless good bacteria. So I explained this to the doctor and the doctor's like, no, those are, those are uh, bacterial shields. Those are bacterial <laughs> shields that the bad bacteria is taking. And I'm just like, I, I don't know. So, You're like, know. how is the Gaza war also playing out in my gut right now? In my gut right now. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just saying it's, they say gastritis, it's gastritis. Sorry, that was bad. But Good uh, God, no. Yeah, see, but I'm, this is why, this is why we love you, Sammy. I mean, this is why I think like you're able to channel your rage into something that actually is funny. And I don't know how you do it. I think we're all in awe of that. And I hope your tummy is okay. Also, you've been traveling you. and eating food in the south. I'm like, Let's yeah, just be real. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of southern takeout. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gonna do a number on your tummy. Um, well, yeah. we're gonna get into what's going on. Um in the Al Shifa hospital. I I think we have her um, because I wanted to bring her in to also discuss this with us. Um, she is a journalist and producer with AJ Plus. She's the host of the Peabody award-winning Direct From with Dina Takruri and the co-host of They Call Me a Lioness, a Palestinian's girls fight for freedom. The very Dina Takruri. Dina, welcome. I know how to unmute myself. Hi, <laughs> good to see you. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Francesca. Hi. So good said, to see you. I said hi earlier during our uh, pre-session, but I think my mic was off because you didn't respond. Oh. So I was like, oh, yeah, good to see you. No, she good heard you. you. She was just like, <laughs> Dina, um, we usually start the show out with what you were bitching about. And I didn't prep you for this because I was like, you know, I got to spare my girl. But like, Dina, other than everything, what are you bitching about today? Is there anything small? Is there anything? Is there a corner of all of this bullshit we're going to talk about that that's bothering you particularly you know right i mean first of all where do you start when you're palestinian right now but right before i joined i came across this tweet it's this is related to everything and it was a former obama national security advisor who is just in new york city at some like halal food cart berating the man completely hateful abusing the hell out of him with like extreme racism and it was appalling. Oh this is a former government official. And so, yeah, I wanted to bring that to your attention. Maybe you can share it with your viewers and, or and listening. So that's that's. I feel I like we should find that and look at it uh, maybe later in the program. Yeah. So so just, yeah. just so just going link. full like Islamophobic Karen on like a halal yes. cart owner, like just, to say the least. Yeah. The, like for no okay, there's a lot of backstory, but yeah, again, it's like yeah, why don't you go get your uh, lobbying job with uh, Uber or whatever Jay Carney is doing? You know, all these like former Obama folks who are all like top lawyers or lobbyists for you know these mega corporations, right. and yet, honestly, at this point, I'm like, you know, I feel like I wouldn't. Here's the thing about Obama and the Palestine legacy, which is really interesting, right? It's like. Yeah, he called BB a son of a bitch. I love that moment multiple times, I think. He was trying, you know, he was speaking out against settlements. 
He, you know, spoke at the American University of Cairo, like his first year in office, remember? But then he also like gave Israel the biggest aid package, I think of, of like our history, America's history. $3.8 billion dollars guaranteed for 10 years, I believe it was. Yeah. So it was just like, it was typical Obama, right? Say one thing, kind of sounds nice, you know, and then with the other kind of like, yeah, nail in the coffin for a peace process, if that ever was, you know, good faith at all. But anyway, um, we will look into change. that one. He's about change, changing his public image, depending on who's there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, you know, I think it was interesting because there was some, he said, I think recently it was him who said something like, you have to give Palestinians hope. And I found that to be both very true, but also really cruel because you can't just, you know, give lip service to hope. You actually have to deliver. Like, it's not about holding folks on, you know, by a thread as more and more settlements are built. Right. It is about actually delivering. So I think that I think is a very there's no real difference at this point between the like, oh, we got to give them hope and like a Trump. Right. Um We'll get into it. Let's actually talk about this. But uh, so there's a couple stories. We're talking about George Santos after Dina leaves. I, I do not want to subject her to George Santos talk. But Sammy, we will talk about this uh, as well as look at um, which turkey we're going to pardon. This time it's a Zionist turkey we're going to pardon. <laughs> Celebrities who've gone off their shit. We'll talk about them in a little bit. But for now, this is the week where... So just updates on Israel's war on Gaza. Uh, 13,000 Palestinians have been killed. Uh, most recently, 82 in a, in the Jabalia refugee camp, um, where also United Nations schools that were sheltering Palestinians were targeted. Um, there may be, it looks like, a three to five day, unclear, maybe just a four day ceasefire. Um, the exchange of some hostages, Hamas hostages, specifically women and children for um, women and children held by Israel in uh, Israeli jails, uh, Palestinian women and children. But this was really the week, guys, where the Al Shifa hospitals become this like flashpoint, right? What's happening? Does Hamas have like a massive underground bunker? You know, is this their central hub? Is it the command center? Meanwhile, we were seeing every single day doctors in Al Shifa saving lives, trying to keep premature babies alive. I mean, just like the most harrowing images, people sheltering outside of it at the same time that the IDF is descending. And what has happened in this last week is that they descended and evacuated patients and or um, sentenced them to death because people, patients in the ICU, many of them did not make it out. But I didn't want to focus on all the sad because there's funny. And that is the way that Israel is trying to spin all of this and spin Al Shifa. And it's not just me. It's not just us talking about it. It's places like the BBC openly um, saying that the videos that they got from the Israeli military and what they were allowed access to has like there's some inconsistencies there when it comes to all the evidence of Hamas being in Al Shifa. Take a look at this little uh, clip here. It has allowed the BBC and Fox News to film at the hospital, though only locations of Israel's choice. This is what they found. Israel also released its own seven minute video, which BBC Verify has analyzed. A watch visible in that video suggests it was filmed a few hours before the BBC arrived. And this IDF video was posted, then deleted, then reposted this time without a section referring to an Israeli soldier who'd been held hostage. I don't know when this was used the last time. Also in the video, we see a room with an MRI machine. And if you zoom in and we get some light over here, what you will be able to see are is military equipment. The BBC was shown the same room. And what we see in the two videos doesn't precisely match. For example, there's one gun in the IDF video, two by the time of the BBC footage. Israel has told BBC Verify this is because more weaponry and terrorist assets were discovered throughout the day. And as always, an AK-47. Israel also says its video is a single shot with no edits. But this appears to be an edit. We don't know the reasons for that edit, nor how significant it is. The IDF, though, says suggestions it's manipulating the media 
are incorrect. I'm not ma manipulating you. Why would I manipulate you? So that was the BBC. And I just, both of you guys, please weigh in, jump in. But Dina, I wanted to ask you specifically because this is very different. The sort of like, we've not been able to verify. We looked at the time of the watch. We see these inconsistencies between the IDF video and our crew that was allowed in. They're giving all these caveats and doing kind of this due diligence that like you don't see American news outlets do when it comes to what really everyone can see is just blanket propaganda on Israel's part. But what are your thoughts? You know, I don't know if your viewers or listeners are even aware that Israel has banned foreign journalists from entering Gaza from the, from the get-go of this war. So all we have there are these brave Palestinian journalists who are risking their lives to tell the stories of their people and getting killed while doing so. Over 50 journalists and media workers have been killed since October 7th. Most of them are Palestinians. And, you know, the journalists that do go in are basically riding on IDF tanks and they have to agree to these terms ahead of time where Israel reviews all their footage and basically calls the shots on what they can broadcast and what they cannot. That is an epic fail in journalism. So when I see something like this, yeah, it is refreshing. They should, every single thing that comes out of Israel's mouth and that comes out of the IDF's mouth should be scrutinized because these are the masters of disinformation. They have lied time and time again, and we have proved this as journalists. They did it when they killed Shirin Abu Akhla, my colleague and friend, and they've done it many times throughout this war. And so it is incumbent on everybody to practice critical thinking skills and actual journalism, which this BBC clip was a, was a, was a small example of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, but Sammy, aren't you swayed by this incredible uh, 3D imaging that... Uh, Israel created a, of the bunker underneath Al Shifa, which, by the way, new info. Apparently, Israel helped build the tunnels underneath Al Shifa. But take a look. So, I mean, if you were just listening, I mean, it's, it's pretty tight graphics. So, like, I just feel like, you know, whoever has the tighter graphics or the people I believe. Um, but this is all like, I don't know, Sammy, I guess, Dina, you're saying that they're the masters of propaganda. And yet it's just so it's like they're not. They're well, not trying I, that hard, it feels. But Sam, no, I, I, they are trying. It, it, it's not fair to say they're not trying because I'm an actor. I've submitted a lot of audition tapes and it's really hard to get a one shot. Like in, when you're <laughs> acting, when you're really getting into character and you're trying to portray something that you're not, uh, it takes a lot of work. So um, you can see that. You can see that with they they count countless times already in the last six weeks. They've posted something. They've taken it down. They've reposted. It's like who does that? Who yeah. does that? Con content creators. Content right. creators. Right. You are creating something when you do that. Yeah, um, but you know, French. Oh, sorry, Sam. I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Go. For, go for it. No, you mentioned that Israel helped build this. Yes, this is a known fact, and it has been a known fact for a long time. Ehud Barak, the former Israeli prime minister, even said it yesterday to uh, Christian Amanpour that Israel did build a tunnel and a bunker under Al Shifa Hospital decades ago in the 80s, I believe, when they were running Shifa. It was part of a, an effort to expand the hospital capacity. So right. that's not disputed. What is disputed is that it's the, this command and control center for Hamas that they claim it to be. The fact of the matter is none of the doctors, they have provided no proof for that. None of the many doctors who work there, including foreign doctors who've worked there for weeks and months, have, have verified this or the many journalists that were posted there for you know weeks in this war or the tens of thousands of displaced people. It is just propaganda. Absolutely. You attack a hospital, that is a war crime and there's no obfuscating that. Well, I mean, that's the other thing, right, Dina? Like, this is the thing, it's like, even if the two AK-47s belong to Hamas and they're underneath, you know, somehow, or someone was underneath uh, Al Shifa Hospital, they're still relying on the idea that we, the international community, would somehow be okay with them shelling and bombing and emergency evacuating and sentencing to die children, injured people, refugees. Like, we're still not okay with that. And you proving, I mean, again, this is obviously, they don't even need to prove it to the people who are already on board with them. Hello, uh, you know, Joe Biden. But speaking of Ehud Barak, who did just say that to Amanpour and like she was like, wait a minute, what? You built them? He right after the raid was complete, he tweeted this out saying, 
um, or he didn't tweet this, excuse me, this was reported that um, he said that the Hamas command center, no, 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 it's in Khan Yunis, not Shifa Hospital. Khan Yunis, which is in the southern part of Gaza Strip, is the real headquarters of Hamas. This is what so is. This is Ehud Olmert, another Ehud, not to be confused with Ehud Barak, who was on oh, Amin Poor, but yeah, you. both Israeli leaders, former Israeli yes, leaders. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, exactly. But like, that's that's the level of like seriousness that they, I guess that they conduct themselves or how stupid they think we are to be like, oh, no, no, no we're in a different spot now. We're in the South now. Um, oh, it's a different hospital. We got to raid it. And now they're raiding and attacking the Indonesian hospital uh, in Gaza. And, and, you know, tens of tens of, I don't know how many people have been killed, but um, it's it, it just like, it's such a joke. It is actually such a joke. Um, but anyway, uh, it is a massive distraction. I just want to read a little bit of uh, Jeremy Scahill said something I thought was really poignant. He wrote, um, if Hamas is decisively proven to have intentionally abused the hospital's protected status and did, in fact, actively operate a command center hidden beneath it, then it should face war crimes for having done so. Hamas, not innocent civilians, should be held accountable for these actions. At the same time, if it's proven that Israel perpetrated fraud in its relentless campaign to portray the most important hospital in Gaza as a secret Hamas military base, then the world should hold Israeli officials accountable for this grave and lethal propaganda. So too should the Biden administration, including the president himself, be made to answer for the U.S. role. I mean, I think that's really clear. He's not, you know, saying, look, it is a war crime for Hamas to use it as a base. But like what's interesting about these flashpoints, right, is that there's so much misinformation and yet it does matter. Like the truth of what was happening, I guess what I'm trying to say is it it doesn't slow down Israel's attack on assault on Gaza, right? But it does matter that they can just sort of move on from something they clearly lied about, just like, as you mentioned, the assassination of a Sh Shireen, who they denied that they killed her for a year and then admitted, oh, sorry, we did, even though it was a shot literally to the back of her head. Um, but anyway, I guess maybe thoughts, final thoughts on this, you guys, uh, on this, on the hospital, like, should we be over, are we focusing on it too much or, you know, or does it, you know, or, or what do you think about that? Not enough. I mean, the fact that, the, the fact that, like Dina said earlier, a lot of people don't even know that journalists are not allowed in there. A lot of people don't even know that CNN had to agree with Israel to basically, uh, you know, control what ends up going out. And like, you've, you've, you've watched the stuff that came out of CNN in the past week, it was it was it was almost just as bad as CNN's regular programming, right? Uh, like, <laughs> like the fact it just it just goes to show that everything's being manipulated at this point. And and yeah. uh, you know, like how do we how do we get journalists in there? Like at, at this yeah. point, it's like how do we even know what's true? And and really, all we can do is continue to amplify the uh, Palestinian journalists who are still posting, the ones who are still alive and risking their lives. That's really all we have left. Right, yeah. who've and been I, labeled as as Hamas propagandists? Hamas, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I want I want to echo that. We can't we can't stop talking about this. We can't stop talking about what happened to Shifa. What's happening to all of the hospitals right now? The fact that in the north of Gaza there still remain hundreds of thousands of people who did not evacuate, who are still there, and they have nowhere to go when they are injured or sick or, you know, they, they can't get any adequate treatment. Even the people who are going to hospitals that remain there with catastrophic injuries like limbs being blown off, blown off lacerations, really terrible things, um, they're not, they cannot be properly treated at this point. They're just getting first aid. Yeah. You know, and then and then wow. and then for those who did flee south, the over one million people, I believe, half the population that did go south, now they're, I mean, it was never safe to begin with, but now they're even at greater risk. And, you know, Israel's saying, oh, well, we think Hamas is south and we think the hostages are south and they're trying to squeeze them into a, a smaller area in the south. There is no safe place in Gaza. Israel's just bombing indiscriminately. The death toll keeps mounting. The atrocities keep increasing. It is astounding. It is astounding. And these pictures, we should never be seeing so many pictures of thousands of dead children, thousands no. of dead civilians. This is Joe Biden's legacy. This is yeah. how he will be remembered. And the only thing that gives me a glimmer of hope is that I saw a poll yesterday that 70% of 18 to 34 year olds do not approve of how he's handling this war. You know, and the majority of Americans are calling for a ceasefire. The majority of Democrats support a ceasefire. Our elected officials here are not listening to us. What, what democracy is this here in the United States when this is the case? 
I had to chew out my representative who uh, lives near and by my house, uh, and I saw him. I I, uh, I hung a sign outside his house, not to be weird, but I did. Uh, was with my baby, and then I was like, you know, maybe I'll run into him. I did run into him, um, and told him what I thought, and he was like, well, here's why I cease for. I'm calling for cessation of hostilities. I was like, bitch, I'm already supporting your opponent. It was, it's so just depressed, uh, you know. It's depraved. He's like, I don't do things for votes. I do things for what's right. And I laughed in his face, Dina. I, you have to know this. <laughs> Sammy, what were you going to say, though? Oh, I was going to say even something like close to 50% of people older, over 65 disapprove of how Biden's handling it. And the other 50% can't hear. So. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still watching CNN and, and watching. But they can see yeah, the one, no, two guns that were perfectly beautifully laid out with some cracks and, sprinkled on top. And the terrorist and the terrorist named after the days of the week on the calendar. Indeed. In By fact, the way, we didn't even point out the fact that sorry, many people have pointed out that an MRI machine is a massive magnet. Any metal would just yeah, ding, like metal, gravitate towards it right. and stick. You can't even have jewelry the, on around MRI. And the baby bottle they found. I think the baby bottle was the best piece of evidence they had. I mean, truly. Like, but but every day. Every day you think you've read the worst story you've ever read in your life. And then the next yeah. day happens. I mean, this is the kind of thing. And and we're all being gaslit, right? And you're absolutely right. So it's like... Speaking of gas. Yes. Fields. Yeah. That's where this... I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the story that should be circulating more. Because the thing about Americans is, like, they don't really care about human life. At the end of the day, Americans are so desensitized that, that like, they don't care about human life. But as soon as you start talking economics, you might get people's attention. And the big story is, you know, what I think really should be for Americans is, is how this is an exploitation of Gaza's gas, you know, in, in the making, as well as the mm. canal in the making. Mm. Um, so you mean natural resources? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the, the Gaza's uh, gas field, which is uh, like valued at something like $500 billion. Um, you know, stories are coming out in, in small amounts. But right. like yeah, kind I've of seen, going back. I've seen those yeah. stories, but I just want to like stress this is about land and it has always been about land. And this is about 100%. a Zionist settler colonial project that is just since you know before 1948 has been seeking to maximize Palestinian land while minimizing the number of Palestinians living on it. And what we're seeing in Gaza is is first and foremost an extension of that. Absolutely. And it's spreading 100%. into the West Bank too, which I know you want to talk about later, Franny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, let's let's pivot to that. But I did just want before we leave, because it is funny, and you mentioned the days of the week. You know, Mehdi Hassan, who's like, you know, our boy on the inside of mainstream news over there on MSNBC, uh, formerly of Jazeera. But you know, he he earlier this week um had this interview with a uh, senior advisor to Netanyahu. Um, Mark Regev. And here he's asking him about those days of the week that were listed in the Al-Shifa hospital that were about shifts. And he was like, oh, they're names of terrorists. That's what the IDF video said. Um, as well as, I believe, it's like an Israeli official who just put out like a clip from a Lebanese film and was like, look, this shows that Palestinians are staging their own death. Like, Wild, wild misinformation. Take a look. I said to you that your military. No, but you were you were quoting to me before you, Hamas numbers, Midi. You were quoting entire, to me Hamas because numbers. The, because the entire UN and the human rights community and the American intelligence community on Friday said they trust those numbers. But you're dodging my question, Mark. I'm not why sure that's you, true. Why I'm did not your sure military spokesman on Monday point to a calendar in Arabic and say these are the names of terrorists on them? That's false. Can you accept that here and now? I, 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 I'm not aware of the, uh, the, the incident. Let's put up the so image. We have the image. It. You have I, no I, comment. I don't read Arabic. It doesn't help me. I have well, no comment. You, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the does incident. Does your spokesman but, uh, read you, Hang on. I have a question, Maddie. You're a journalist. Have you made a professional mistake ever? Not no, intentionally, I'm, but have you made a professional I'm, I'm, mistake? I'm, exactly. And I own up to it. Have so you can made you own ever, up to the mistake? So can, can, not, so can you own up to so, the mistake So if I made it, I've made mistakes. You've made mistakes. But there's a difference between making an honest mistake and between Hamas that deliberately exaggerates numbers Understood. to suit its propaganda purposes. There's a huge Understood. difference. So it sounds like it's like it. so it sounds, so it's, hold, on, hold on. You said propaganda. Can we just deal with your colleague Ophir Gendelman's tweet? It's still up seven days later. Why has it not come down? It's a Lebanese short film. We can put it on screen. It's not Palestinians faking their own injuries. Can we own up to that mistake and take that down? Is that not propaganda? I, uh, uh, once again, I understand that that was also a mistake. And so why is it still uh, up seven I'll days speak later. to Offer about it if you like. I'll speak to Offer about it if you like. He's Great. a friend of mine okay. and a colleague. I quite like him. He's a good man. I'll speak to Offer about it. He's a good man. <laughs> he, he literally said, at one point, he literally said, I'm not familiar with the internet. 
Arabic, never heard of the language. It's like, just, again, it, they're laughing in our faces. And yeah, there are a few journalists like Mehdi Hassan who's like, not going to let something go, not going to move on, going to stick to the point and got him to say, haven't you ever made a mistake? And this is just, guys, before we move on, these, these are part of that like bullshit gaslighty crocodile tears that some of these propagandists are like, oh, haven't, haven't you ever made a mistake? You know, it's a little bit like we're supposed to feel for him or something. Like, oh God. We should have said, yeah, if I made a mistake, it didn't translate to the genocide of an entire population. Exactly. Like mistakes are doing right now, but. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and it's also like, also the question, oh, so Hamas is, in. if you say they're inflating numbers, do you mean there are fewer children who are dead? Isn't that a good thing? Like, just, it's just so ridiculous. Um, and, and like the last thing I'd want to say before we talk about Dina, your book and, and, and your reporting is there's also new information about, you know, Israeli helicopters firing on those um, festival goers, right? That we now know that actually Hamas didn't know that there was going to be a festival on the day on October 7th. Um, the festival was extended. It seems like they were not a target initially. Um, and that first responders from Israel, from the Israeli military, according to them, did not know who was a so-called terrorist and who was, you know, a festival goer. And like, just kind of shot at random. And, and that's why you see those, the cars that were burned out. I mean, I remember in the initial footage of October 7th, I was like, what the fuck? Like, what is that? Like, who, why are, and it's like, oh no, it makes sense. That seems like weaponry that a military like Israel had. But that that's just information that's going to like wash over us. Um, we're not supposed to talk about that. And yet it's like, oh no, they might've killed their own people. Okay. I hope they free their hostages. Anyway. Yeah, they really, I mean, they've really perfected the art of like timing when it comes to publicity. I mean, the, the there's still people like circulating 40 beheaded babies like that. When, when you float, when you float something around that intensely in the beginning, when you float a lie that around intensely, by the time it actually gets debunked, people are already on to the next thing. And, and you know, most 100%. people have accepted it as valid. And it's like the same thing with this. Um, this should be a major story, but it's for some reason just getting slept on. Absolutely. I, my, my prediction is that as more time goes on and more investigations are carried out, we will learn that even more of these deaths that Israeli civilians suffered on October 7th were at the hands of Israel and them doing things like this, like dropping bombs and seeing those crazy scenes of scorched cars, you know, um, yeah. it'll be interesting. This is something that we need to keep paying attention to. But yeah, I, I, I you know, it's it's surprising the disregard that Israel has shown for its own civilians, not just in dropping bombs and not realizing who they're hitting, but also the lack of prioritizing the release of their own hostages as time is running out. And some of them are getting, you know, supposedly killed in, in, in the bombings by Israel. Of course. Don't you care about your own citizens? Of course. And, and that's why we're seeing so many protests uh, by Israeli citizens in Tel Aviv, marching all the way to Jerusalem, um, demanding which their you release. Also don't, which you also don't see, you know, like you don't see CNN or like mainstream news, you know, they'll sit down with like family members who say the right things. And the right thing is um, not criticizing the Israeli government. The right thing is, you know, just sort of these human interest stories that seem sort of, you know, you talk about, you know, this poor family, which like, yeah, it's, it's, it's got to be hard to have a, you know, a family member who's a hostage now, but like all of the other folks are crying out for an end to the bombing and a cessation, a ceasefire, cessation. <laughs> a cessation, as, as my rep would say. Um, but Dina, hmm. you want a goddamn Peabody in the last time we worked together and even, so I, I can't take credit for it, but I kind of still want to take credit for it. Go um, for it. <laughs> and in part, um, your series um, from the West Bank that, you know, you spoke to Israeli refusers, you spoke to um, civilians, people living in uh, the town of Hebron, and you spoke to Haid Tamimi and you wrote a book with her. Um, we'll talk about that book in just a little bit, but I did just want to play everybody a portion of Dina's reporting. And this was the piece that did win her this Peabody. And you can see why. This is what I experienced minutes after setting foot in my family's hometown. We literally just got here. We went through the first military checkpoint and a bunch of soldiers stopped us, started yelling at us. 
I'm in the old city of Hebron in the occupied West Bank, a place that once bustled with life. But I'm about to see what Israel's occupation and settlers have done to the heart of this city. And to the people who live here. I'm a Palestinian-American journalist, and I've spent much of my career reporting on the occupied territories. But Hebron, one of the West Bank's largest cities, is also my roots. My father was born and raised here. I've returned to learn how the occupation has decimated his beloved hometown, a place he hasn't been back to in years. I had a mixed feeling, nostalgia with anger, despair over despair, what can I say? I know it's really hard for him to see this, and so it's emotional for me. And we have a link to the entire, uh, uh, well, that that reporting in our in the bio there. Um, I did protest with your dad uh, on another uh, assault on Gaza. Twenty fourteen. <laughs> so I feel very close to him and the family. But I, but but tell us, Dina, about. I mean, I know there's updates about what's going on in Hebron because what's not getting as much attention is the amount of settler violence that has popped off just in the last, you know, six weeks since the beginning of the war. Um, so yeah, what have you heard? And also like, what, what does it mean for a city that is slowly being encroached upon by settlements, by the Israeli military? What does that do? And what did you hear and witness? That was probably one of the most depressing days of my life going there. And it wasn't the first time I'd been to Hebron, but I didn't, I, you know, I went knowing my dad kind of grew up around there, not realizing it was literally in this neighborhood. And you saw how the day started out. We were, this was, by the way, this was a year ago. So this is well before October 7th. This is the reality on the ground for Palestinians that live in the occupied West Bank, swarmed by Israeli soldiers, harassed, detained, later on attacked by an Israeli settler, later on, you know, having a conversation with another Israeli settler from Brooklyn, who told me there's no such thing as Palestinians, you know, speaking to a Palestinian girl who every time she and her, her name is Selwa, 13 years old, every time she and her uh, siblings play right outside of their home, settlers throw rocks at them, you know, hit them in the face. They have nets above their house to catch the trash and the rocks and the everything that, you know, these settlers that live there in violation of international law constantly throw down at them. It is one of the most depressing places on earth. And when I came back from, from that assignment, I couldn't look at the footage for a while. I was, I was traumatized. And you see that trauma playing out on screen in that one day we filmed. Hamid Safin, you know, our, your former colleague you had on the show a couple of weeks ago, and Kate Elston, also your former producer, produced this. This is their pod, Peabody as well. And they recognized how hard it was for me to, so they, I had to step away from it and they really took the lead. Um, what was a horrible situation to start out with in terms of Hebron is even worse right now. It is on complete lockdown. You know, the, what we've seen Israel do in since October 7th is just carry out massive collective punishment against the Palestinian population at large, both in Gaza with the constant bombardments and in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem with mass arrests and raids, the increase in checkpoints, the increase in you know, just making the Palestinians' lives their hell. In that mm -hmm. neighborhood in Hebron, there are 700 Israeli settlers living there, and they get full military protection. Meanwhile, the 35,000 Palestinians can be shot right now if they step outside. And what they're saying is that they've never experienced this type of lockdown, this type of prison. You know, they can't even go outside of their homes. Like, And those that do, you know, I've heard really, really alarming testimonies of Palestinians that are getting arrested, that are getting abused and sexually abused by Israeli soldiers and settlers alike. It is awful. Sure. I mean, it's, I, I've tried, there is no corollary in the United States, but we do have gentrification. <laughs> so it's like, imagine if gentrifiers also had like armed to the teeth, militarized, you know, private security that stopped you and frisked you and like, maimed you and threw rocks at you like it just it's just like it's like it's wild and it's wild that someone would say to your face palestinians don't exist when they like spend their time harassing them on the yeah. daily on a daily basis sammy mm -hmm. i wanted to bring you in because you know you are part palestinian and i i wanted to find out yeah more about where you're from or where your family's from and have you visited or, or and like no uh, my my teta's from Yaffa. 
Um, so she she left in forty eight. She 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 went straight to a refugee camp in Lebanon and then uh, went to Beirut after that. So I've never gone back. I've had um, I've ha been asked to go to the West Bank a few times, but it was like really last minute, and I, I wasn't able to go. Um, so yeah, I, I've I have yet to go. Um, but I have a lot of friends in the West Bank, and just you know, aside from. Every, everything that's horrible going on both in Gaza and in the West Bank. It's like there, there's people, they, they're afraid to even leave their houses or, or, or like I have a friend who lives in Janine and has a, a girlfriend in Hebron and, and can't travel between the two because he's terrified that he'll get killed like along the way and, and vice versa. It's just, it's so that's, that's the case for everyone. That's, that is yeah. what is happening right now in the West Bank. People don't want to yeah. leave their homes. They definitely don't want to leave their towns. Because there's, they're afraid they're either going to be arrested or violently like assaulted or, or killed by a settler. On the road, driving, you know, in this in the safety of a car on a road, you don't even you're not even guaranteed that in your own land. Dina, or how they'll big be messed with by soldiers at checkpoints because there's you know there's there's a, a huge increase in in military checkpoints right now, and you know the soldier will easily point his gun at you, tell you to get out, might hit you, might whatever. It is yeah. just completely unsafe. Yeah, yeah. And how big of a city is Hebron? It's very big. It's a big town. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's the biggest in the West Bank. This week also, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it, you know, Biden was saying that he may consider, they're considering imposing sanctions on any, any settlers who are attacking Palestinians in the West Bank. Um, they may revoke visas, right? Um, I know there might even be, if you talk to someone from Brooklyn, dual citizens, people who are American citizens who moved um, again, to, I can't, I can't even believe that. <laughs> who, um, yeah, who've become settlers in the West Bank. Um, and I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? that? That was taken as like a, wow, that's a big step. Um, but yeah. Such that's, a small, I mean, it's, yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, it's, it's not, it's not a wow. It is nothing. These settlements, like I said, are, they violate international law. I'm pretty sure they violate US law. So instead of sitting here and targeting individual settlers and saying, oh, well, you don't get a visa waiver, you don't come to the United States, put some red lines on Israel. Tell them no more. Tell them to dismantle these settlements, you know, mm -hmm. that are if people, you know, just to just to visualize this, we're talking about settlements that are in the West Bank. You know, mm -hmm. this is ever decreasing territory that decades of U.S. led peace negotiations have said this will be part of a future Palestinian state. These Israeli settlers, many of whom do come from America, they did not choose to live in Israel. They chose to live in Palestinian land and mm -hmm. harass Palestinian people and take, you know, even more of their ever diminishing land and make their lives there a living hell. And they're not like these fringe whatever people. This, this, this current Israeli government is the most pro-settler in Israeli history. These yeah. settlers are in the Israeli government. You know, so for Biden to just single out a few people and, you know, issue this caution is, is really nothing. It's the like extent to which he refuses to draw any red lines on Israel, whether it comes to the massacres and atrocities we're seeing in Gaza or to the flagrant human rights abuses we're seeing in the West Bank, it is so disappointing. It is infuriating. Infuriating. Yeah, no. And and I think, uh, again, I've talked about this. We talked about this um, m in many weeks about, you know, yeah, he's losing. He's us losing with the same young people um, that put him into office, uh, that voted for him in droves, um, especially in swing states and especially in the Arab American community that he will need their vote uh, to win again. Um, and it's just funny because this is also a guy who like said he ran for office because of what he saw in Charlottesville and, you know, the, you know, the sort of the far right, na you know, white nationalists. And yet these settlers are like, they're like enclaves of Kyle Rittenhouse's straight up. You know what I'm saying? They are like vigilante psychos who are supposedly very religious. I don't know. I don't know. Look, that's not as between them and their God. I don't, that doesn't seem very religious to me. UN says 251 settler attacks since, since October 7th, 30 incidents that resulted in the deaths of Palestinians or injuries, 185 that damaged pro Palestinian owned property, 36 that resulted in both injuries or deaths or damage to property. And of course, we can only imagine how much of an undercount that is. But I think one of the most shocking things about the footage that, and I'm not sure, Dina, did you? see settlers in your footage because the sh the images of of men just with firearms randomly not part of the military just settlers shooting and pointing at people was incredibly disturbing and again i don't say kyle rittenhouse lightly it feels like that kind of vigilanteism 
Yeah, I saw teenage boys like in a school courtyard, you know, right where I was reporting, and they have rifles slung around them. They're all armed. They're yeah, all and they're armed not IDF. Start, and on top right. of that, after October 7th, Israel's far-right national security minister, who is, himself has been convicted of like supporting a terrorist organization, further armed them with more rifles. Yeah. There's videos of those going out. Francesca, so, yeah, I, don't, I don't think Rittenhouse is like a fair thing to say, because Rittenhouse was actually from Kenosha. <laughs> right, exactly. He was actually, but he did cross state lines. But yeah, Dina, you have to go soon, but... I do want to talk about your book briefly, um, as much time as you can give us. They call me a lioness, um, a Palestinian girl's fight for freedom. I had to Mimi's story that you co-wrote with her. You sat down with her. You interviewed her um, again. And what was the year that she slapped an Israeli soldier who had just shot her cousin and I believe killed her uncle? Tell me. Tell us briefly. And yeah. Yeah, so it was December of 2017 when she slapped a fully armed Israeli soldier in front of her home and was subsequently arrested and served eight months in an Israeli prison for that slap. She turned 17 behind bars. She finished her high school um, senior year basically behind bars and that, that, um, that you know, ex like final exams there. Um, yeah, that soldier or someone from his unit had shot one of her cousins at close range in the in the head. She believed that he was going to die. He miraculously survived. Since then, he's been shot other times and he's just not the same. Um, so this is a girl. I mean, this th this moment was like made her sort of iconic and went super viral back in 2017. I interviewed her when she got out of prison. I was one of the first journalists to sit down with her. We established a rapport. And from there, I wrote her book with her. But this is a girl. This is a child who grew up sort of in the spotlight because her village in the West Bank of Nebi Saleh, they live right mm. across the street from an illegal Israeli settlement. Literally, here's their, here's their house, there's a mm. valley, and the settlement's right here. And for years, the settlement has been encroaching on her family's land. They confiscated their natural spring, which was their main source of water. And so when she was a, you know, a young child, um, her village, led by her father, sort of took up this nonviolent weekly resistance movement where every Friday after the Friday prayer, they would all gather and they would just march, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes they would try to make it down to the spring. And every single week they were met by a fierce and violent and brutal crackdown by the Israeli military. We're talking like tear gas, skunk water, rubber coated steel bullets, eventually live, live fire. So before she was even 11 years old, she saw her cousin shot and killed right before her a long range tear gas canister straight to his face. Oh my and then God. she saw her favorite uncle killed, you know, on the hillside behind her house. This is this is the violence, you know, that she grew up surrounded by. Um, she went to prison. She got out. We wrote this book together. It is her story, but it's also the story of modern day Palestine. It's also the story of what it's like to grow up as a child under this occupation, to never know a day of freedom in your life, to only know checkpoints everywhere and a massive, you know, a, a apartheid wall and violence and just have every single dream of your life cut short. She has never had a normal life. They ruined her life. And unfortunately, on November 6th, yet again, Israeli forces raided her home in the middle of the night and arrested her once again. And she's 22 years old right now. She's inside Damon prison in Israel. She um, had communication for the first time with a lawyer who was able to meet with her yesterday. I spoke to that lawyer. The lawyer said that, you know, it's been about two weeks since her detention. And I had says she still has bruises on her body mm -hmm. from the abuse she suffered at the hands of her Israeli captors. Um, there's she has not been charged yet. So she's being held without charge um, a week or a week, about a week before she was arrested. Her father was arrested. Also, a longtime activist who Amnesty International one time labeled a prisoner of conscience just for exercising his right to peacefully protest. He was making his way to Jordan and got arrested there. And that's what Israel's doing right now. They are rounding up so many people, especially former prisoners and holding them mm -hmm. in Israeli prisons. Now the conditions in these prisons are, they were bad to start out with. They have gotten much worse. Um, yeah. The lawyer said that there's not enough food for the girls. They're the, the, the women are in, in crowded cells without you know enough blankets. It's cold, they're being deprived food, they're being deprived any sort of news from the outside. They're in, living in complete isolation in really terrible conditions. Yeah. Um, so, and her father, I don't know if I mentioned, is serving time under administrative detention, which is a designation Israel uses to arrest someone without charge or trial for up to six months. You have no idea why you're there. They have a secret file against you. And after six months, they can continue to extend it for six months. So some Palestinian prisoners end up serving years under administrative detention, never knowing why they're being held. I mean, and, um, and to say nothing, 
the fact that this is a political and a justice system um, that Palestinians have no say in, have right. no, have absolutely no voting rights, no, no jurisdiction over, like they are not represented in that so-called justice system. It is an illegal justice system. And I believe I had when she was finally released or I, went like basically said as much this is an illegal court um so yeah and 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 by the way they're also you know detaining this is a news just today Mossab Abu Toha who's a poet was He's detained. been released but oh, he was released. he was detained yeah just like yeah the, but you're right the These intellectuals are... the leaders anyway Israel tries Palestinians in the occupied West Bank in military courts military courts, okay, where the judge and the prosecution, they're all members of the military. These courts have a conviction rate of close to 100%. There is no, there is no due process. There is no fairness. And these, you know, Palestinians are ultimately ruled by Israel, but they're not citizens of the state of Israel. So as you were saying earlier, they cannot vote in elections. Now, here's the crazy part is Ahed is, you know, being currently being tried in a military court. If a settler, and we don't know why she's being held, we, she hasn't been right. charged yet. So it's effectively right. an abduction up until now. If a settler, like one of the ones living right across the street from her, were to commit a similar crime, they're tried in Israeli civilian courts, you know, and they have due process. And this is like an example of the dual legal system. That's one of the many examples of what Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the Israeli Human Rights Group, Beit Salem, says is apartheid. This is yes. apartheid exemplified. It's untenable. I mean, I think that's, I think what we've learned, and I hope everyone has learned that, is that, and, and this is the thing about, you know, the occupation, it's easy to think that it's just stagnant, that it's, there. there's just a status quo. There's no status quo. There's no status quo under occupation because it's always getting worse. There are always more lives taken. There's always more land taken. There are always more bombs being dropped on Gaza every however many years. Like it doesn't stay the same. So everyone needs to remember that. And it's, it's like as we go back and just look, I mean, look at the last few years, what's been happening in Gaza. Look at the last few years in the West Bank. It's like, no, this is getting worse. It is absolutely untenable. And I just want to, everyone should buy uh, they call me a lioness. Please get this book. It is yes, Dina, hold yeah, it up. But yeah, it, up. it is beautifully written and accessible, and something that again, like you don't have to. Doesn't come from this necessarily a macro, um, you know, bird's eye, but really through the eyes of Ahed, through the eyes of someone living in the West Bank. And yet, Dina, I found it like also like super succinct. Like you get to what you need to get to. You talk about the history. It's like it equips you with what you need to know, but also through this beautiful story of, of a young girl who, and I love that I didn't really want it. She didn't want all this shine. She didn't want this fame. Of course, she wants to be like a, a 22 year old. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I really deliberately wrote it in a way that, like you said, is accessible. I wanted this to be a book that anyone who has absolutely zero knowledge of Palestine can pick up and read and understand what's going on today. So I encourage you guys, if you yourselves want to learn, if you know someone, the holiday season's coming up, please buy this yes. book, support Palestinian authors and support Ahit Tamimi. Don't stop telling her story and the story. You know, she's one, again, who doesn't like the spotlight and she just wants to use her platform to shed light on the many other Palestinian women and children just like her who are behind Israeli bars or who are just laying in this in this untenable and oppressive brutal occupation so she's just an example of, of of millions that's what she always says well please keep us posted on on her status and what we can do um yeah if it yeah what we can do but honestly i think uh chewing out your representatives about about all this and making sure this you know this our cries and calls continue this is a long haul guys this is uh this is going to be um anyway uh, yeah, and I just know. wanted to, I know I'm going to hop off, but I just want to say thank you so much, Francesca. Like you have been on, I've known you for over a decade now, and you have been always on point when it comes to this story, you know, and this is, it's so incumbent on everybody watching and listening to support independent journalists like Francesca thank so you. that we can get these stories out. We can get these facts out. So please, in addition to buying the book, in addition to supporting Palestinian charities, support Francesca and independent <laughs> journalists like her. She did not ask me to say that, but this woman has been holding it down for as long as I've known her oh. and more. So thank you so much for that. Girl, really. I love You're you. Wonderful. You're so sweet. Thank you. Um, all you know, right. it doesn't, that's the thing. All right, all right, bye. Get out of here, Dina. Uh, <laughs> you're great. Be well. Um, it's it's weird to be like thanked, Sammy, um, because it's like, yeah, I don't know. If you let learn me, let me, or let me, let me Let me bring it back down for you. See it at the open Please. mic. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyone want to come to my wine cave show <laughs> yeah. um, with uh, seven people? Um, <laughs> no, but I, I, I'll echo what Dita said. No, friend. You, I, I, ever since I've <laughs> seen your work, too, same same thing. I actually met you guys at the same time. Uh, I know Dina didn't have any time for small talk, but I, I met you guys at the same time at the same show. And actually, Dina and I had a, a Palestinian literature class together at Cal. Back oh, in I love 2004. that. 2004. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, going way back. Yeah. Wait, you went to Cal too? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, shit. No, I was just going to say it's weird to be thanked because you're like, you know, anyone of conscience, like, you don't have to be, you know, an anti-Zionist Jew. You don't have to be part Palestinian, Palestinian. You just have to know what's going on to be like, this is the worst thing that is currently happening in the world right now. It's the worst crime. And it, you know, for 75 years. And uh, I can't believe that we're supposed to just go along with it. And my government is funding it. So, but yeah. Um, Sammy, yeah, any the, final the, words before we leave the topic of this war for just right now? Yeah, yeah. This is a, this is a breaking point. I mean, you know, uh, as horrible every, as everything has been, I've always, you know, tried to remain optimistic in the face of every single setback. Um, this this is this is the big one. This is the one that's going to open eyes for the people who've had their eyes closed. It's the one where you see countries start, starting to take action. Countries starting to sanction Israel. Countries starting to you know expel yes. the ambassador of Israel. Um, you know I'm I'm for nonviolence and stuff, but you even have some scabbles going on with uh, with like Hezbollah and um, the Houthi rebels in Yemen. It's like Israel is not going to be left unaccountable for what's happening. Um, and I think it's also you have the biggest awakening of the American public that you have. You have six yeah. or 66 percent of Americans uh, pro ceasefire. You have uh, Palestinian protests like just pouring into the streets of every major city. You don't have the same response for for you know Israel. It's um, it's no. it, it's an awakening. It's an awakening. And, and as horrible as everything is and, 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 you know, I wish no more violence to anybody else. It's like this is this was bound to happen and it's what's happening and, and we have to use this as the catalyst to get through it. Well said. I really appreciate that. And I, I do feel, you know, like in, you know, it is silly and crazy that people are like finding Osama bin Laden's letter to America. But what I think what I was trying to talk about on Friday and I think what is important to know is that like some of the underlying reasons of like how why would people in the Middle East be mad at the United States? It's like those reasons are still not unresolved it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that someone like bin laden is correct right. um but it definitely means that israel's a massive liability and the tune to which we fund its military is absolutely bonkers and ridiculous and we should not be sending our tax dollars over to kill children and so like in the ways that we were not able to connect the post 9 11 world um with, you know, sort of the root causes, we are connecting them now. And that is in part because of just how honestly ruthless and relentless the Israeli military has been on innocent people. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's funny because I, I think there's like, there's a before and after here. And I do think yeah. that, especially in politics, it's not going to be a third rail issue to talk about Israel, Palestine. It will be maybe one of the first things because it'll show where you stand on like human rights more broadly, um, US funding to, you know, war criminals generally, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and let that continue on to whether it's funding Saudi Arabia, whether it's funding, you know, uh, a war on Yemen and so on and so forth. Right. But, right. Anyway, wake up and we, smell the oil, guys. I mean, this is the thing. Saudi Arabia has Biden by the balls when it comes. They're like, oh, you know what? We're yeah. just going to. I, I don't know. It's so. And then they're like, we're going to transition off of oil, but not yet. Ooh, so soon. Not quite yet. You can get a rebate if you can afford a <laughs> Tesla, though. We'll right, give you right, a rebate on right, that. Right, right, right. Um, thanks, buddy. Um, let's get into though, because let's let's change it up. We're changing it up. Let's talk about you know pretty much like probably an op for um just comedy humor having an op for happiness george santos representative george santos uh truly is a plant so that we can all remember that there are really hilarious things happening in congress including just this man anthony devolder 
George Santos, uh, Kitara Ravanche, which I think was his drag name or whomever. Only um, Sands is what I call him. What do you call him? Only Sands. Only Sands. <laughs> so we'll talk about that. Because recently there was a, his entire ethics investigation was revealed and he has now decided he's not running for re-election, which is super sad for all of us. Um, he is facing or was facing 23 counts of a federal indictment, including charges that he stole from his donors, falsified campaign filings. But Thursday's report, including hundreds of pages and previously unseen texts, emails, financial records and other documents colored in vivid new detail of the years long fraud. Like what? Um, he sought to exploit every aspect of his House candidacy for his own personal financial profit, wrote uh, the committee in summary of their findings. He blatantly stole from the campaign. He deceived donors into providing what they thought were contributions to his campaign, but in fact, payments to his personal benefit, like um, trips to casinos in Atlantic City um, and the Hamptons, purchases at the French fashion house Hermes, um, regular cosmetic treatments labeled Botox on internal campaign records, and even small purchases on OnlyFans, a platform best known for allowing creators to sell explicit photos and videos to subscribers. Those outlays were just a fraction of the tens of thousands of dollars that he siphoned from unknown donors, propping up the kind of glittering consumer dream the 35-year-old son of immigrants never could have afforded himself. I like the sort of like, but he did it because he's the son of immigrants, you know, just like a little bit of love there. Um, they deny it, blah, blah, blah. Um, he denies it. Um, for the first time in his life, Mr. Santos has a steady income, however, $174,000 a year house salary. It's true. Um, let's talk about the OnlyFans part, though. Arguably one of the funnier aspects of this. Um, here is a creator on OnlyFans. This is Layla, Layla Lewis, who tweeted, this guy was subbed to me. Ha, 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 ha. And then she replies, I rated his dick. <laughs> nice. Like, Is that something you do on OnlyFans? I, I'm, I'm I don't know. There, I guess so. you can. I guess you can. Yeah. I don't I can't imagine you'd want to subscribe to OnlyFans to only be like um insulted. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of my dick? Sammy, <laughs> God, I just explain men to me. What do you think of my dick, oh, lady? <laughs> what do you think of my dick? It's a two. Gross. Trash. I love you. Um, but here he was. He was on um, Fox News. Uh, and this is Kennedy, who is just such a horrible person and human being. But she was very funny in this instance where he says he didn't know what OnlyFans was. And she just under her breath says he can't tell the truth. Take a look. Um, speaking of peel, is it true that you have an OnlyFans page and you can peel a banana with your feet? I don't have one and it's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll indulge you this. I just discovered what OnlyFans was about three weeks ago when it was brought up in a discussion in my office. What do you think? And I was very, I was oblivious to the whole concept. <laughs> uh, uh, you just can't tell the truth. All right, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't tell the truth. But also, he, she's legitimately asking him, is it true that you can peel a banana with your feet? Uh, this is yeah. news. This is oh god! Like, and also, why? What? Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not surprised. I mean, of all of all the creepy things that you know, Congress people have done is peeling a banana with your feet. I think it's more one of the innocuous ones. You know what I mean? Something. <laughs> Let's you be could, real. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's like uh, if you're yeah, if you're aghast at that, think of what they're doing to the poor in this country. But yeah, no, if, if only. <laughs> Right. This guy's a character, but it's, it's, it seems like he's going to be gone pretty soon. Right. I mean, it seems like his, his whole, his run is over. It's, I think it's sad. It's also just proof that like, not everyone can do the Trump. Like, you know, you can't just mm -hmm. Trump your way into things like Trump. You can't just peel a banana with your big toe and expect to. I'm still like, I don't actually know why that's sexual. I, I don't, <laughs> I don't. It's sexual. I don't know. You can't peel a dick. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if, like, what? This is like the. Un is it true that you can, like, unwrap a Starburst in your mouth? Because <laughs> I'm. Uh, should we try it? Let's see. Like, remember when you were 13 or 12, and you're yeah, like, if you yeah, can yeah. unwrap a Starburst, you're good right. at, like, kissing? Like, that's what the right. fuck is. If this? you can peel a banana with your feet, you can run for Congress. That's exactly right. You know, who knows what happens at the, uh, you know, Republican orgies that they had got going on? Um, 
that Madison Cawthorn got to said he went to said he went invited to a few yeah and then they just ousted him like that but you know here's the funny thing Sammy no one still I believe no one in the Republican Party excuse me the leader is it Mike Johnson now unclear yes Mike Johnson no one's asking him to resign because they're all too afraid that they're going to lose a seat in the house right (laughs) <laughs> just like yeah we let him peel our banana our, our well our dicks like bananas and it's fine i don't know why i made it i yeah well he sits there in the cafeteria and he's just peeling a banana in the corner with his feet and we say that's fine that's all good but he's wearing a beautiful hermes scarf while he does it so it's all good um all right well let's hope there's a little bit more out of santos uh after this whole thing is done But we have one more segment, Sammy. It is our fun final segment. It is Thanksgiving in Mm -hmm. but a few days. What is your favorite Thanksgiving dish go? Uh, Probably stuffing. Good answer. I like stuffing. It's It's, just. It's it's just most. It's bread. It's yummy bread. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. Here's, Here's what I'll say that I, that like 15 year old me is very aghast and very mad at is, uh. Uh, I like cranberry sauce now. Like I really fuck with cranberry sauce. Yeah. I want. I'm gonna make some cranberry. I like all kinds. I like the chutney where it's like a little mm-hmm. bit, you know, bitter or mm-hmm. sweet, whatever. Um, or like the relish. There's like relish and chutney, and then regular. I like it all. I just like it. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not? That. I mean, that just goes to show Indian people are already on it. They do chutney with everything. It's like exactly. why exactly. Why just put a little not? bit of yummy jam on everything indoctrinate cranberry sauce that's what i'm saying that's what it is um okay so let's go because there's always a pardon of a turkey this year there were two turkeys who were pardoned by the the biden administration and i want to ask that we pardon people who've also been sort of acting out (laughs) i want to pardon for their actions and behavior celebrities who have been revealed to be rabid Zionists and are completely on one recently. This is Pardon This Turkey. Pick three white guys. Um, just to sort of make it even playing. We, we've, we've talked enough about Amy Schumer. She will not change. Uh, she'll just have a bunch of specials and it'll be everything will be fine and she'll just you know do a lot of incredible material about hamas lovers and whatnot it'll be very funny um but she will have stolen that from other lesser zionists uh, of course but we have michael rapaport who's been just completely on one recently since october 7th sasha baron cohen and brett gelman of stranger things do you watch stranger things sammy oh uh, yeah i saw i saw the whole franchise okay. Yeah. Well, it's not over. I mean, give it some time. <laughs> uh, there's still more mind to be flayed. But okay, let's start with my favorite, which is Michael Rappaport, who has been doing videos like this. This is the video where, again, you see his boomer Zionist brain like exploding. He thinks everyone just hates Jews. And he's also blaming TikTok. And Sammy, you put a lot of your content out there. You've got a lot of fo- followers on TikTok. So what do you think? Take a look. At this point, you're just choosing to embrace Jewish hate. Jewish disdain, hate of Israel, because you all know, everybody knows that Hamas is a shit-stained, terrorist-ran organization that would end your life if they could. You, 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 and all of the LGBTQ. Why you want to hate? We don't know. Personally, I don't care. It's less about the Jewish people in Israel and more about your totally miserable, inconsequential, itty bitty, lonely existence. That's why so many who are complaining about their ADHD and their depression haven't mentioned it since October 7th. It wasn't your ADHD or your self-diagnosed mental health issues. It was about you having absolutely no life, nothing to live for. You had no life. Nothing to live for until October 7th. And presto, change on no more mental health issues. You little blow job. (laughs) Oh, I want to hear the rest. (laughs) You have no life. 
says middle aged man in yeah, on a beautiful fall day, yelling at his camera, yelling at the kids. You Jew hater. It, this is just like boomerism, like like gone to in like the lost in the space time continuum of like boomerism. Like the kids on TikTok with the ADHD and they're bored and blah blah blah. And also, you're a Jew hater. Um, you had nothing to talk about. Now you're talking about genocide because you know there is one. Um, and like just. He's been like this every day. He's been like this every day, freaking out about it. Um. Anyway, so that's but, that's yeah. number one contestant. Yeah. We let's continue because there's okay. more. Sasha Baron Cohen behind the scenes, but he and other um celebrities, I guess, uh, have m- taken meetings with TikTok and slammed them for creating the biggest anti-Semitic movement since the Nazis. That's right, people. Um. If you if you heard of Nazis and Hitler, um, just imagine that, but like with bad dance choreography, uh, that's what like like TikTok is as bad as Hitler. That's what we're saying. Um, he said, "quote What is happening at TikTok is it is creating the biggest anti-Semitic movement since the Nazis." He declared on a call, according to the video exchange. Uh, shame on you, the Borat creator added that the service could, quote, flip a switch to silence such videos and noted, quote, if you think back to October 7th, the reason why Hamas were able to behead young people, there it is, and rape women was that they were fed images from when they were small kids that led them to hate. What? I'm not sure I follow. Is he saying that Hamas had TikTok that they saw tiktok images from when they were anyway it's very unclear um but apparently when you talk about occupation or you talk about genocide or you talk about you know innocent lives being lost in gaza you hate jews of course and all he wants to do is just flip a switch sammy you've had your videos literally deleted because you said the word palestine what do you think how's the how's that algorithm going I had my whole tiktok banned in 2021 so i i let him know they did a great job um (laughs) Man, it's just again. It's it's like you see he used the beheading thing. It's just like as soon as you say beheading, it's just like okay, you're not listening. So what your voice, you know, you've totally. been, you know, beheaded yeah. metaphysically. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. And then there's Brett Gelman again, who is uh, one of the characters on Stranger Things. I can't remember what his character is, but he's sort of like the older, old journalist or something like that. It was like close to getting the mind flare. I forget. He's been on one on Twitter saying, as you radical leftists shout your misinformation and tear down posters and refuse to denounce Islamic terrorism, both Hamas and the right wingers are laughing at how you've played into their hands. Mwahaha. Hope the Jew hatred was worth it. Just like you're a grown man, grown man, grown man with career, just tweeting this out to the ether. As if anything you're saying is true. He continues, ask yourself why you don't condemn all of the Arab nations who have oppressed and murdered Palestinians. Really? How so? What are you talking about? Why do you only choose to focus on Israel? Why do you not blame Hamas for spending billions of dollars in aid for weapons? It's because you hate Jews. No, it's also because it's very difficult to turn food rations into uh, Kalashnikovs. It's just a weird thing. Like when (laughs) you get, you know, also, um, and spouting my favorite line, which is, Hamas really should have invested in infrastructure. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Could you give them, you know, the the switch to the lights, the electricity? Could you give them access to water? Could you give them access to their own skies? You know, and also could you stop bombing Gaza? It's it's a, it's the like, did you, you have an older brother who used to hit you with your own hand and say, Why are you hitting yourself? It's just wild. So I anyway. We got three of them there. We have to save one of these. We have to pardon one of their actions. I'll tell you who I'm not pardoning, but I'm curious about what you think. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I'll go first, I guess, then. I sort of of said it. I'm going to not... There's no way I'm pardoning Sasha Baron Cohen. Absolutely fucking not. Um, And that is because of the following. Sasha Baron Cohen has spent his entire career mocking... uh, pretty much all different cultures except his own, really, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Specifically the Middle East, Central Asia, um, Kazakhstan, Kazakhs, right? Um, He is in mocking them. 
for a higher purpose, right? Which is to make fun of right wingers. So he punches down. I've heard it described as punching down in order to sort of punch up in this sort of bait and switch way. And let, I, I like Borat. I like it as a character. Like, it's fine to me. Like, yes, it's offensive. Yes, I think it's also funny to expose, you know, people's Islamophobia and all of that. But when suddenly you're like a comic who's like, yeah, I fucking make fun of everybody, whatever. But, and then you have one thing that you are 180% serious about that no one can criticize, that no one can make fun of, that no one can mock, which is your undying loyalty to a murderous state like Israel, then fuck you, dude. Everything you've done is just weird, op not weird, opportunistic, bad faith, and you're, you're not a fucking... Like, I'm not going to respect that. I don't respect that. If you were a comic through and through, I respect that. But no, I don't. You ever watch Sasha Baron Cohen? I mean, amazing character work. But you ever watched him just like talking during an interview? He's <laughs> incredibly boring. He's bad. Yeah. He's bad. He's not a good actor either. I have never liked the characters that he's played. Like, like characters that he's played that weren't like actual characters. Um, and he could have gone the other way. This is a guy who got Dick Cheney to sign, you know, a waterboard playing like an IDF soldier. Yeah. I thought that was funny as hell. But it's yeah. like, oh, okay. But you are on the side of like indiscriminate bombing. Mm, got it. Um, anyway, and you want to silence people. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to forgive Michael Rappaport. Because Michael Rappaport, he's just so on one. And I feel like he'll be okay. He'll be fine. He'll realize the error of his ways in some moment. And then he'll, he's one of those people that I think will go even like when he realizes he's like for Palestinian human rights, he might go really hard on it and it'll be funny. And he'll just like call the IDF Dick Stain, you know, you know, Dick Stain propaganda. He'll do that thing, but like for liberation. So these are the guy I'm saving. What about you? Yeah, I'm going to go over report as well. I think that uh, <laughs> you can, you can blame it on his boomer brain. I think that he, uh, I, I think that he's he, he also he I think he rants for the sake of ranting, like, you know, not to dismiss what, you know, obviously he's done it enough to, to, to see that he really means it. But I think that he's he's definitely playing it up, whereas those those sound bites from the other two were enough to show that they're just uh, misinformed and, and quite deranged. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, he's just doing it for the algorithm. You know, yeah. you can't blame him. We all do things for the algorithm. Sammy, what are you doing for the algorithm and or real the real world these days. Tell people where they can find you. Uh, you can check out my tour, sammyko.com, or just Google me, Sammy Obeyed. And uh, I got tour dates for the rest of the year. And going into next year, I'm just doing stand-up everywhere. And I'm talking about what's going on. can always count on me to talk about what's going on on that day. I, uh, you're, you're such a, you're so incredible. You're such a machine and also such a wonderful person. Um, Thank you like actually a good person you're welcome sammy obeyed o-b-e-i-d if you're not following him do yourself a favor your latest bit on being olive colored skin and depending on the season being you know stopped by police or not is just so fucking funny and i love thank that you. thank you <laughs> sammy be very well take good care sending you so much love um and thank you everyone for being here and chilling with us for this stream for this show um reading some of your comments and then fucking off into our fine day. Uh, Marjorie Taterbean, thank you for becoming a member on YouTube as well as Donald J. James. With your membership, as well as your membership on Twitch, you can watch back all of the content, including all those bonus episodes. So however you um, prefer to support the show, I accept it. It is all great for me. Um, and... If you want to become a patron, that is the way I would prefer it. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room is where you go for that. Remember, you will get a special RSS feed to listen to, the, to our bonus episodes as a podcast. And you'll have the regular episodes on there as well. You get 20% discounts off of merch. Bituationroom.com. Um, shit, I got to work on our stupid friend Tifa packs. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Um, oh, and I think I want to announce... I think I'm going to announce this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to announce this. I was looking for the American Prospect. You also get discounts on the American Prospect. But I would like to announce uh, da, 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 another live bituation room. That's right, people. I'm sorry, East Coast folks. I'm sorry, Midwest folks. I'm sorry, everywhere else, folks. It's going to be in San Francisco back for SF Sketchfest on Sunday, January 28th. My guests, the tickets are available. Uh, we will put a ticket link down in uh, the. Um, description here 
uh, the tickets are already available. My guests are going to be Nato Green, who you know and love and probably miss because he hasn't been on the show in a while. Miles Gray of the Daily Zeitgeist and just confirmed the majority reports, Emma Viglin. That's right. I'm getting Emma out. I'm getting Miles uh, to San Francisco and, of course, Nato and myself. What a fucking lineup. It's going to be so good. Um, make sure to get tickets. I will not let you forget that, but uh, really excited to be back at Sketchfest. Uh, we sold it out last year, so if you missed it, um, now is your chance. And if you were there, come back. Um, Archie 15 says, can we send them our Nazis? I hear they accept Nazis. I mean, straight up, like speaking with speaking about Israel, they do. They do accept our Nazis. They're just happen to be of the Jewish faith. You know what I'm saying? They behave like Nazis. I'm not calling them Nazis, but um, and no, they don't want any more of them. Camperman 5000. Javier looks like Wolverine's crush badger. Oh, that's. I didn't even, oh, cousin, <laughs> why did I read crush? That's right. I was wondering what we looked like. I didn't know about Badger. I got to look him up. But yeah, Malay looks exactly like that. Um, C-Man Assassin 20, 420 on Twitch. Love Franny's guests, especially when they're comedians, intelligence with comedy wrapped in humility and thoughtfulness. I mean, Sammy's all of those things. And then he also continues, C-Man, that IDF is spitting in our faces with this propaganda. It really insults our intelligence with buffoonery like this. I mean, it's also anyone who's carrying water for the IDF, like the, the comics or excuse me, the actors we just talked about Rappaport or Baron Cohen or um, Gelman. It's just like, aren't you embarrassed? Like this is super embarrassing for you. You know what I mean? Like their, their propaganda is so bad that their lies are so blatant and obvious. That's got to really be embarrassing for you. Um, Counter Dragon says, didn't the IDF pass out assault rifles to settlers on October 8th? That does not and would not surprise me at all. Ibrahim Muhammad says, settler colonialism is the same as pilgrims, is the same as missionary work. I mean, it's colonialism, tale as old as time. Um, told for Twitch says, go bird with birds. I forgot what this is about. Tell me about the birds. Tell me about the birds. Rock and roll forever. Uh, on Tuesday, Attorney General Merrick Garland was asked about crypto regulations, the potential Israel-Hamas hostage deal, and Hamas's use of crypto. You know, um, Paige, uh, our producer, also pointed that out, that Hamas, apparently there's like a new thought that Hamas is using crypto, which is just so funny. It's like, I don't know, maybe, but it's also like, let's put all of the buzzwords in one headline soup and like just whip it up to what like whip fear of it like you know just add like trans in there hamas is doing the trans crypto book book banning i don't know like just ugh. um hef on youtube says george santos has changed his name again to georgia trump so he can get away with his crimes uh, i do hope that that is his new um uh like drag queen avatar or name because Georgia Trump is cute. Uh, Wendell Smith, uh, the channel's great. I should have checked it out. We saw it from the thumbnail. Thought it was a Karen compilation show by a red-haired white woman. What? <laughs> I we don't do Karen videos. I mean, we should. If we actually want to views, we should. Robert, you're so generous. Thank you so much for the five dollars. Pretty sure Nazis with bad choreography is Mel Brooks, the producers. Zing. Amanda, thank you so much for your super sticker. Appreciate you. Um, Valk says Biden is older than Israel. This is true. This is very true. Um, he, that's why you can't keep up with them. They're so young. They're such young guns. And with that, guys, um, do we have any, any, you know what? It doesn't matter. You need the fart song. I need the fart song. We all need the fart song. You know, every time I'm in a bad mood, I'm like, you know what I could use right now? I could use a fart song. But there's more. Um, let me find out where I'm looking here. Thank you guys so much uh, to Hendrik Norborg for becoming a new patron at $10 or more. You are lovely. I love you. Thank you to the people who have subscribed uh, on Twitch to fight for the cause. Resubscribe with Prime. Spending these Bezos bucks on that little baby. Thank you. I don't know if you mean my little baby or me as a baby. 
Peg Junk, thank you for resubscribing for one month at tier one. Thank you, Punch Up Dragon, for resubscribing with Prime. Um, Frank Morning Tree giving out 10 community subs. Thanks so much. And Undead Pixels giving out a community sub. Frank Morning Tree, you're wonderful. Really, really appreciate you. Um, and again, thank you to Marjorie Taterbean and Donald James for becoming new members. We stream every mm, Tuesday and Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, except for this Friday. But I'll be back Tuesday. Guys, banger shows coming up. I'm talking not only Nicholas Guthman, but we're going to talk about to Kamal Franklin about Cop City. We're going to talk to Trita Parsi about the um, broader regional implications for uh, Israel's war on Gaza. Um, so it is just is going to be good. We're going to have some great comics coming up as well. And Andrew Th Singh, thank you so much for that support and your super sticker. Um, thank you to Paige Omek, the producer. Thank you to Maximilian Inhoff and Andy Vasoy, our editor. Um, what else do I have to say? Oh, tip the show, TBR-Live on Venmo, TBR-Live on Cash App. And remember, fight the power, fuck the patriarchy, free Palestine, and don't just bitch about it, be about it. Mm -hmm.